Okay, really, last lecture was the key lecture, okay? We introduced all the objects, and now we are going to study up to, hopefully, not the end of the course, but almost. I mean, almost the end of the course, okay? And now the problem is what these objects mean, okay? Principal, second fundamental form, well, first fundamental form is kind of trivial. It's a scalar problem, okay? But second fundamental form, principal curvature, Gauss curvature, mean curvature, and slightly less important at first, but, I mean, principal directions, okay? This is really what we have done. The problem is, what are the geometrical meanings of these numbers or vectors or whatever, or, or forms? Okay, we left, we interrupted it in the middle of a sequence of uh, examples. If I remember right, we stopped at example three, just to keep on doing, learning how to do also computations. You see, you will see that, I mean, co the computational side of what we are doing is quite simple, okay, once you, we make few examples. So, let's look at the cylinder, the standard cylinder. What do I mean by the standard cylinder? I take the surface given, as usual, as with an equation, R3, such that x squared, for example, x squared by plus y squared is equal R squared for some given number R. Okay? So, how does it look? Well, of course, it looks like this. So, on the, on the plane z equal to zero, you have a circle. Okay? And then the equation doesn't see z. So, that means that if one point is on the circle at z equal to zero, every point, whatever z it has, will lie on the surface. Okay? So the, the whole line parallel to the z-axis will stay on the surface, s. So really, just to draw it, you take one circle, and then on every point, you add the vertical line. Okay? So, and then it's better first to do the picture, and then to draw the axis, x, y, and z. Okay, so that's what, what we are looking at. Well, as usual, first, so let's do the complete exercise. Is it a regular surface or not? Well, you have many, many ways to see it, but I mean, since it's born as an equation, as usual, what do we do? We take the function f of x, y, z, which is x squared plus y squared, and then S is F inverse of R squared. Okay, so the question is, is R squared a regular value for this function? Okay, how do we know it? As usual, we should compute, in fact, uh, and if it is a regular value, what is the tangent space? And once we know the tangent space, what is the normal vector, if it's orientable or not. I mean, does, does there a unitary normal vector exist over everything? But well, we know automatically the last everything because, I mean, so df at a given point will be what? Will be the, the linear map represented by, well, or, or first we should, what is TPS, okay? DPS is either you write it as Ker DFP or the set of vectors V of R3 such that the scalar product with the gradient at a given point is equal to zero. So the gradient is a normal vector. Okay, every time it's a it's an inverse value of a function. No? And what is the gradient, or I mean the, which is a, the same matrix representation as the differential? So it's take partial derivatives of the function. Okay, so it's twice x, y, zero. Okay, as a, ma as a matrix, actually I should write it. So this is the metric representation with respect to the standard basis. Okay, it's the linear map which is represented by this matrix. Okay, the gradient is actually the vector which has these components. Okay, so the gradient of F, the point P, is equal to twice X, Y, Z. So, and uh, at this point, so this shows you, tells you immediately that this is a regular value. Bec why? How is it possible that this is z the zero homomorphism? Well, it has to be x equal to y equal to zero. But p has to be on the inverse. So of course, there is a point. There are many points where this is zero. 
every time x is equal to y is equal to zero. But do they lie on f inverse of r squared? No, and of course, that's the only reasonable requirement. Otherwise, if r is equal to zero, this is not the cylinder, this is the line. Okay, in fact, that this shows you that it's not a, it's not a, it's not a surface. Okay, it's a curve. But in this case, so once we know, so the tangent vector is automatically given as the normal space to this vector. So since I want the unitary normal, n of p will be just grad f at p divided by its norm. Okay, and how much is it? Well, here we wrote, of course, the two. I forget it. It's x, y, 0, divided by the norm. How much is the norm? R. Okay. Again, when I say n is equal to this, of course, you could object. Then for you, maybe n is minus this. There is always this undeterminacy here. Okay. There is not a unique normal vector. So if I choose that, what, that what, what, what does it mean? For example, at this point of the surface, I'm taking the vector x, y, z, x, y, zero, which is really this vector normalized. So of course, you usually draw it pointed at the point on the surface. So that means I'm taking the normal vector going outside. Okay? You could have chosen the other one. No, no reason for not doing that. Okay, but you, sooner or later you have to make a choice. So, as being a, an inverse image of a regular value, the surface is orientable, and this is a choice of a unitary normal, of an orientation, okay? Well, now let's compute everything. I mean, second fundamental form and everything we defined last time. What do we have to do? We have to compute dn, the differential of the Gauss map, at a given point p. Okay, apply to some vector v, where v now is not any vector of R3, but it's a tangent vector to the surface. Okay, so the, per the question is, what is this map? Well, let's give a few names. So v, suppose v is v1, v2, v3. Okay, let's give name to the components. What do we have to do? Well, the most effective way is all, once you have the explicit expression of the map, compute the differential, you go back to the definition. There is no need for any subtle trick here. So again, in your mind, you take alpha such that alpha of zero is equal to p and alpha prime of zero is equal to v, okay? And you compute what? Well, so this is equal to d in dt at t equal to zero of n composed alpha, okay, of t. And how much is this? Well, that means alpha of t will be x of t, y of t, z of t. So this is equal to what? This is d in dt at t equal to 0 of x of t, y of t, 0. And how much is it? Sorry, 1 over r. That's the map n. Okay. How much is it? Well, I take the derivatives and compute at t equal to 0, but these become the components of v. Okay, so this is equal to 1 over r, v1, v2, 0. Okay? So, now if you want, how much is the, the second fundamental form of the cylinder applied to two vectors, vw, so you see, it, it takes two vectors and gives me a number, I, without even writing, so w, well, W will be W1, W2, W3. So this is by definition the scalar product of minus dNPV, scalar product with W. So I have to take minus this, scalar product W. So this becomes minus 1 over R times what? V1, W1 plus V2, W2. There is no third component because there is a zero. Okay? And now, how much are the the principal curvatures, and then everything else as a cascade? Okay. Well, 
is for either you diagonalize it by formal uh, algebra or you make some geometric choice. Let, I prefer doing geometric choice. It's clear. So if it's clear, suppose at this point here, I mean at any point, so this is my point P, it's clear that I have two special directions. So let's go and check if they are really special also for what we are doing. The two special directions are the vertical direction and the direction tangent to the circle passing through this point. These are clearly two obvious choices of vectors on the cylinder. So if V, so V could be this one or this one, or of course in general it can be skewed, but I mean, let me take either this or this. So if V is vertical, V vertical, how much is DNPV? Well, vertical means it has only Z component. It, it will be a vector of the form 0, 0, something. How much is dn? It's 0. So in particular, it's in, it, it is an eigenvector. So, let, so you have immediately found an eigenvalue. 0. Okay? So one of the two eigenvalues is 0. But before deciding if this is k1 or k2, we have to compute the other one because I don't know who is the biggest. Okay, so how do I check what is the biggest? Let's try to take, let's see if geometry is really what's behind all this computation. Let's take the other v, the, the one tangent to the circle. <coughs> so v tangent to the circle. How much do I, how much becomes this? Almost, almost V, one over R, yeah. It's immediate to check, but that means we have found already the second, the second eigenvalue, because this means that this V is an eigenvector, this is an eigenvalue. Now just remember, if you remember, because I keep on forgetting it too, but in any case, so we have really to look at the eigenvalues of minus dn. Okay, so then this becomes minus the eigenvalue. So the two eigenvalues are okay, made a mistake in my notes. K1 of P, so the smallest one, is minus 1 over r, because it's negative. Well, OK, just for convenience, let's suppose r is positive, so we don't waste time. k1 is 1 over r, and k2 is 0. <clears throat> and actually, we have automatically found the principal directions. I mean, from the way we found them, we know already which are the principal directions. In one case, it's the vertical. In the other case, it's the horizontal, OK? So what is the Gauss curvature? Zero. How much is the mean curvature? Okay. Now, okay, that's the end of the story. Okay, on this example, just one thing. So this was an exercise, and uh, with the excuse, we found another interesting surface. But the output is a bit strange, okay? And this, we will have to think about what this really means. The cylinder, well, if you ask my four years old baby, and you say, is the cylinder flat? Well, I can tell you, I mean, he will say no. I mean, but we found it has constant zero curvature. So now, as mathematician, we will say something is flat if it has zero curvature. So what's going on? Well, this is a very important question. So how is it possible? That so, so we would have liked a theorem saying k equal to zero if and only if it's a plane. And now we know already that this theorem is false. Of course, if, if it's a plane, k is zero, but it's not the unique surface having zero curvature. 
So what's going on? This is a subtle question. I don't want to give you the answer now, but focus on this problem, okay? Freeze it and let's move on. Because now I really want to understand geometrically what is the second fundamental form? What is the geometric meaning of the second fundamental form? Well, we start, let's start with the definition. We take a curve on the surface, in fact a regular curve, just to avoid trivialities, and just to fix notation, let's, suppose, let's say it passes at time zero through some point P. Okay. Well, being a curve in R3, well, it's a curve on a surface, so in particular it's a curve in R3. So if I forget the surface S, I could apply what we learned in the first three lectures of our course. course. So I, I can study it as a curve in space, so I can apply to it, uh, I mean, it, uh, it will have a curvature, it will have a torsion, it will have a normal, a tangent, a binormal, and so on, the Frenet triedron, and so on, okay? Now, what is the interaction between all those things and the geometry of the surface? That's, well, in order to do that, so let's say I need to fix some notation. So K is the curvature of alpha as a curve in R3. Well, it cannot be anything else, but I just want you to, I mean, there is no conflict of notation. I mean, K has not, little k, is nothing else. So, I mean, it's the curvature in R3. And suppose, and we call cos theta the number n, n. So now here there is a conflict of notation. So I have to explain to you, because remember, when we look at, so, in fact, let me draw a picture. We have our surface S. We have a curve alpha, okay? And suppose this is our kind of central point P, okay? In fact, it's a very bad place where to put P. Okay, we have a point P. Now, now here there is a problem of notation because if I study the surface, here I have a normal vector. But with the same notation, you could say I have a normal vector to the, sur to the curve. And we called it capital N, unfortunately. So now we have to distinguish the two because there is absolutely no reason why capital N, I mean, the normal to the surface and the normal to the curve should have anything to do at all, okay? So, <clears throat> so in fact, presumably, if I, if I imagine the alpha B moving, in, uh, alpha of T moving in this direction, I would say the normal looks more or less here, okay? The normal to the, to the curve, okay? So, in fact, here I define so n normal to the curve to alpha in R3, okay? Meaning take your notes of the beginning of the course and change the notation because little n will be the normal to alpha. And big N, capital N, is the normal to the surface, okay? And then cos theta is the angle between the two. These are unit vectors, both, by definition. So the scalar product is really the, ang is the cos, cos, cos of the angle between them, of the oriented angle, okay? Well, then, if I, in some sense, kind of algebraically project the curvature of alpha to the, to the curve, I do something, I define a new function that I call capital, uh, sorry, k little n, eh? which is just k cos theta. 
I mean, what? And this is called the normal cur curvature normal curvature of alpha at p. And of course, this depends not just on alpha, but on s. OK? Because to define this function, I need s. I need the surface, because I need the normal vector. OK? So in some sense, it's the projection on the of the curvature to the surface. OK? So pictorially, what's going on? Well, that means more or less, I mean, this is the normal line, OK? If I imagine to take the projection, the orthogonal projection of the normal to the curve to the normal to the surface, OK? Well, in fact, I should draw another vector here, which, I, which is kn. So instead of looking at n, I look at kn. And then I project to the normal line to the surface. And the normal curvature is exactly the length of this vector here. OK, this is linear algebra. <coughs> One observation, remember, n, as usual, so the orientation of a surface is not uniquely defined. I picked one n, you could have picked the opposite n. What does it happen to the normal curvature if you choose the, the minus one, the mi uh, minus this one? It changes sign. Okay. So in fact, when I say the length of this vector, I mean the oriented length. So for example, in my picture, this would be negative. Okay. <coughs> Now, let's see. Now suppose, so this is the end of the definition. Now suppose, since it's a regular curve, we started with a regular curve, we can parameterize it by arc length. Okay, and we give it the usual name S to the arc length. And so we can restrict the normal vector the normal vector field to the curve alpha. So n, which will depend in general by two parameters because it's defined on the surface, I, I, I restrict it to the curve. So that means for every point of my, of my curve, I look at the normal to the surface restricted to, to, to alpha. Okay. Let's try to get some interesting equation. Well, what do we know? We know that n is normal to the surface, and alpha is a curve on the surface. So in particular, alpha prime is a tangent vector to the surface. So the thing I know is that n of s, scalar product, and this is true for any s, not just at 0. n is everywhere a normal, and alpha prime is everywhere a tangent. So this is identically 0. OK, every time I see something like this, I take the derivative and see if the derivative of this equation is telling me something interesting. As usual, the derivative is the same. So here, what do I get? I get the derivative of this. So this implies n prime, and then I drop the of s, OK? These are all functions of s. n prime alpha prime plus n alpha double prime is equal to 0. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's freeze it. Let's freeze this equation for a second. And now, let's try to compute the second fundamental form at p applied twice to the vector alpha prime of 0. In fact, and from now on, this is the last time I write. So if you see a quadratic form with only one vector inside, it means you apply twice to the same vector, OK? Just to shorten a little bit notation. How much is this? Well, this is by definition minus 
dn at the point p applied to the vector alpha prime, scalar product alpha prime. This is the definition of the second fundamental form. But how much is dn p at alpha prime of 0? By the definition of the differential. So here, what, what should I do to compute this? I should take alpha. Oh, by the way, I have one alpha. Passing through a point p. Oh, I, I have it. With some tangent vector alpha prime. Oh. Uh, and taking the derivative of the restriction, of the composition. But I've given it a name to, to the composition. So this is nothing but n prime in this notation. So this is minus n prime at 0, scalar product alpha prime of 0. And now I use the frozen equation. n prime, which actually was true at ev for every s, but now I'm using it only at 0. n prime scalar product alpha prime is actually minus n alpha double prime. So this is minus, so this becomes exactly equal to n at 0. But n at 0 means n of p. Alpha of 0 is p. So n of p, scalar product, alpha double prime at 0. OK? But how much is alpha double prime? Now we go back to the theory of curves. This is the, der the second derivative of alpha is a curve in R3. And this is parameterized by arc length. So alpha prime would be t, and alpha double prime, by, defi by definition, is kn. By the defini it's the definition of k and then simultaneously. Okay? So this is with plus or minus plus n scalar product k of p, k of, uh, uh, how, would, how do I want to call it, k of... Uh, of alpha of 0, I mean, which is p, OK? So k of p, n, little n. Now, this is the new notation, OK? Not to make confusion. So the normal to the curve at the point p. But what is this? Well, of course, the scalar product is linear. I take the curvature out, and I'm left with the scalar product between the normal to the surface to the, and the normal to the curve, which is here. So that's exactly k times cos theta. But we have just given it a name. It's the normal curvature. So this is exactly kn. The normal curvature to the curve at p. Hmm. So that's it. This picture is telling us exactly what is the second fundamental form from a geometric point of view. So summarizing, if p, if, uh, oh, p is any point on the surface, but if the only thing really we have assumed is that alpha is parameterized by arc length, meaning that, that alpha prime is a vector of norm 1. So if I want to, to, to draw a general conclusion, I say if v is a tangent vector at some point with norm 1, then I can apply this machine. Okay? And then the second fundamental form at the point P applied twice to V, and now I start using the, the shortcut notation, is equal, is equal to, let's write it in, in, in English, okay? Even, even though it becomes long, is equal to the normal curvature to the normal curvature of any, and here this, this is why it's worth writing down, of any curve, of any curve passing through P with velocity V. So you see, once you write it in English, you realize that here there is a theorem. It's not just a geometric interpretation, but there is a, a simple corollary out of this, 
which is interesting and quite surprising in some sense. Which is, which is what? If you give me a curve, I go and compute its curvature, its normal curvature, and I have this property. But then the output does not depend on alpha. The output depends only on P and V and the surface, of course. So that means the corollary implicit in this statement is that any curve passing through this point with a given velocity has the same normal curvature. Of course, this is not true for the standard curvature. I mean, a point and the velocity does not determine the acceleration. Otherwise, the theory of curves would be, also mechanics would be an empty subject. You know? okay. You can have curves passing through some point with a given velocity and having all possible second derivatives. I mean, this, you cannot reconstruct the second derivative out of the first. Out of the first at a given point. Okay. <coughs> but this is true for the normal curvature. Okay. This is actually, this, is, this was the way this, all these things were stated, and it's called Euler's theorem. But now we can push it a little bit further because you see now here I didn't draw v. So v was some vector here tangent at that point to alpha. Okay. But now let's suppose that we apply this procedure to every v in the tangent space of norm 1. Now how many vectors of norm 1 I have on the tangent space? I have a circle because it's a plane so it's, it's a circle. It's the circle of radius 1. Okay. Now <clears throat> remember this is something related to what we saw in three dimension in the example in three dimension but certainly you know it the eigenvalues of the quadratic form actually have this kind of this simple interpretation so they are the critical points of the value of the quadratic form restricted to the sphere in the in the vector space okay this is what we saw. So remember, when we, we, we have picked a 3 by 3 symmetric uh, matrix and we looked for the eigenvalues, that's what we essentially did because we, we picked the minimum and the maximum of the associated quadratic form. Do you remember? We had A and we looked at the function A, A, V, V. This was our F. And we looked for critical points of this. That's exactly what I mean. The general picture, okay? Eigenvalues are the critical points of the quad. This is the quadratic form associated to A. Okay, so if I use this standard interpretation of the eigenvalues of the quadratic form, and I apply to the second fundamental form, what do I get? I get that the principal curvature. So now, in, in some sense, what we are doing it simpler than in this example because this is dimension two. We did it three by three. Okay. Now, if we apply that, we know that k1 at p and k2 at p have to be the minimum and the maximum. Okay, this is, this is smaller, so this is the minimum, and this is the maximum are the minimum. And maximum. Of the quadratic form of which they are eigenvalues. Well, so that's the second fundamental form. Restricted to the set of vectors, to the vectors of norm 1. Well, if you don't restrict it to the sphere, in this case it's a circle because it's one dimensional, 
Of course, there is no minimum and max. I mean, there, certainly there is no maximum because if you keep on multiplying by lambda, uh, you get lambda squared. And, okay. So you, you need to restrict it to a compact set. So it has a minimum and a maximum, and this is the interpretation. But now we know that the value of the second fundamental form in one direction is exactly the normal curvature of any curve passing. No, no, now we, we reread this statement. And that means that well, that means that if I take the, the, any, vec any curve passing through this point on the surface, its normal curvature, it's bounded between k1 and k2. OK? That's automatic interpretation. But now, now I need to, so let's uh, uh, make an, another picture just of the tangent space. We have this point. I don't draw the surface, otherwise the picture becomes too complicated. I have the tangent space at the surface. I'm restricting myself. Now I'm looking at the set of vectors of norm 1. So I'm looking at the circle in this, in this plane. OK, so this is the set norm of v equal to 1. OK. In this circle, there are two special vectors, the eigenvectors to the second fundamental form. So second fundamental form has two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors. So let's suppose you have an E1, let me call it E1 and E2. And they have to form an orthonormal basis because it's a symmetric operator. Okay? So let me say, let me fix just as a fixing the notation. E1, E2, orthonormal basis of TPS of eigenvectors. Well, since I prefer linear maps to quadratic forms, I mean, this is of minus D and P. So that's the linear map where, which has eigenvectors. OK. Now let me use this basis. So now if I pick any, any vector V in this of norm 1, so given any V, it will be what? It will be something like cos theta E1 plus sin theta E2 for some angle theta. Okay, so it's a basis of a plane, so. Now, we have just learned that the normal curvature is equal to the second fundamental form applied to V. Well, I mean, this is the normal curvature somehow in the direction V, okay? This is by definition minus D and P V scalar product V, but V is this one, so let's substitute here. This is what? This is minus D and P cos theta I1 plus sin theta I2 scalar product cos theta I1 plus sin theta I2. Let's expand it. Remembering, of course, that in 1 and 2 are just not just any basis, but it's a basis of eigenvectors. Okay? So, so for example, of course, it's dn is a linear map. So dn of cos E1 is equal to cos dn E1. But how much is D, dn E1? dn E1 is by definition k1 E1. Well, I didn't say E1 is, of course, associated to K1 and E2 is associated to K2, okay? Okay, so this becomes, well, let's do everything. This becomes cos theta E1, uh, cos theta K1 E1 plus sine theta K2 E2, scalar product cos theta E1 plus sin theta E2. Sorry, E2. But then E1 and E2 are orthonormal, are orthogonal and unit. So, of course, this times this becomes 1, but I get a cos squared. So this is minus cos squared theta K1 
and this one scalar product E2 is zero, they are orthogonal, this one times this is zero and this one times this one is minus, because there is a minus in front, minus sine theta squared, uh, K2. Okay. So this is telling me, look, do you want to compute the normal curvature in one direction? The only thing you need to know is the angle of this direction that you are interested in with respect to the eigenvectors. So give me the angle with respect to E1, and then without doing any computation, you know how much is Kn. Actually, here probably it's a, I mean, do you, okay, this is Kn of V, okay? So in every direction there is a normal curvature. And this is called, actually that's somehow the way Euler got it, so this is called Euler's formula. <clears throat> well, this gives a very beautiful interpretation of the second fundamental form, and we are pretty satisfied. Now, may I raise? Now, let's give another few names to some of to, to objects. Let's start attempting to understand what is the Gauss curvature because, as the name suggests, this is critical. But we won't really be able to give a completely uh, satisfactory, I mean, complete answer to that. So we have to be a bit more humble. Now, a point on the surface, S, is called, so let's give names to special points on, on the surfaces. So it's called elliptic, there's a one, elliptic, if k of p is positive. Okay. Hyperbolic, if k of p is negative. <clears throat> and now you would expect parabolic if k is equal to 0. But you have, we have to be a bit slightly more careful because that's true. Parabolic if k of p is equal to 0, but we, we have two ways of getting 0 curvature. And here you will we want to make a difference between the plane and the cylinder. That's kind of the example you need to have in your mind. The plane has zero curvature because, so the curvature is a product of two numbers. The Gauss curvature is the product of two numbers. Okay? So how it can be zero? It can be zero in two ways. They are both zero or one is zero and the other is not. You see, and this is exactly the difference between plane and cylinder. So we want to give two different names to this situation. Parabolic is somehow, it's the cylinder in your mind. So Kp is zero, but Dn, one way to say not both K1 and K2 are zero. Dnp is not the zero map. So of course, it, K1 is equal, K2 is equal to zero, means both eigenvalues are zero. That means the map is the zero map. Okay. And then, of course, we call it planar. And this, you don't have to make any effort to have a model in your mind. If Kp is zero, because Dnp is actually the zero map. Okay. 
Well, let me first go on, because now natural question is, at least that, do these points characterize the plane? I mean, uh, the answer is no. It's still no. Okay. There are surfaces which have planar points, and the, and the surfaces are not the plane. But let, let's go back. Let's come back to this uh, to this later because the list is not over. If the two, so there is another algebraic uh, and in some sense already geometric for this Euler interpretation of the of the second fundamental form special situation. Well, when you diagonalize a matrix, of course, the, the special situation, if the, if the eigenvalues are all different, it's kind of the generic situation. If multiplicities of the eigenvalues jump, you say, well, this is kind of a special thing. Well, let's give it a name. If, if at, at some point you have that the two eigenvalues are the same, so you have one eigenvalue with multiplicity 2, P is called umbilical okay. okay so I don't know how much English I mean umbilical means it's this one okay if you want a model for an umbilical point you have it I mean you have it <laughs> looking down okay well, especially if, like me, you have kind of a round situation. <laughs> that makes it even more umbilical. OK. Now, <clears throat> um, OK, we will come back to that. Well, the point is, let's start with this one. This, this seems to, to be the, the, the most special case. So in some sense, if it's more special, it, it should be easier to understand. So let's. What is a standard, uh, uh, the simplest example of a surface where you can find umbilical points beside your body? Yeah. Well, if you start with your usual list. Uh, example zero is the plane. Are, are there umbilical points on the plane? All of them. They are both two curvatures equal to zero. OK, but this is kind of stupid. Let's go to example one, the sphere. Are there umbilical points on the sphere? Every, Every point on the sphere. We have already, so the sphere, whatever center, whatever center you have and whatever radius you have, we have computed the second fundamental form and it turned out to be one over R, the identity. Well, we compute minus DMP, okay? So the minus DMP is one over R, the identity. That means that the two eigenvalues are the same and they are 1 over r. Okay? So is, is made of umbilical points. Okay? And you can ask, well, are these two situations the only possibility? So not that if a surface has an umbilical point, then it is a plane or a, or a sphere. That would be really too much. So one point cannot tell you the global geometry of a surface. But I mean, here what's happening is something more is stronger. I mean, if every point is umbilical on a surface, is the surface the plane or a sphere? And the answer is yes. Let's prove it. If S is connected, I mean, because otherwise you have to argue on each connected component. In principle, your surface could be a plane and a sphere. As, as, far, as long as they don't touch, a plane, union, a sphere, it's a regular surface. Okay? It's all made of umbilical points, and it's not a plane, and it's not a sphere. But that's a stupid one. So if that's, F is connected, and every P in S is umbilical, then I cannot say S is the plane of the sphere because maybe it's just a piece of, okay? So then S is contained in a plane 
or in a sphere. Okay? So that's the only reason possible statement, and that's true. So let's prove it immediately. It's going to be quick. How do we prove it? Well, suppose we have such a surface, and suppose we take a local chart around some point. I mean, it doesn't matter. No. So let's first prove that the image of a chart is satisfies the proposition. Then we will argue that then the whole surface satisfies the proposition. <coughs> okay, so let's take a tangent vector. So let's take a W in TPS. Being a tangent vector, I can decompose into the standard basis if I have a local chart. So W will be some kind of A X U plus B xv for some choice of a and b, because this, that's a basis. Okay. And how much is d and p of w? <clears throat> well, d and p of w, now we use the fact that every point is umbilical. If every point is umbilical, the two eigenvalues of d and p are the same at every point. But what is it? So this is a transformation between a two space to a two space with two eigenvalues equal. So that's exactly the multiple of the identity. That multiple of the identity. Okay? So this is equal to, but this multiple, the factor, which is k1 or k2, which, is the, the, which are the same, in principle depends on the point. Nobody here is telling me. Well, I mean, at one point they are the same. At another point, they are the same, but who is going to, who tells me how much? I mean, is the, are the two saying the same? I have no reason, I don't know. So let me write it lambda p w. Okay, there is a function, which will be k1, k2, okay? okay. Now, so in fact, really, the heart of the proposition is that so, because what, what does it happen on the sphere or on the plane? Is that this, this function does not depend on p. In one case it's zero, in the other case it's one over r, and it doesn't depend on p. But in principle, in this statement, I have to leave this free, okay? So, in fact, I want, now, in some sense, I want to prove that lambda does not depend on p. That's the line of the proof. How much is d n p w? Well, if w is this vector, d n p w is nothing but a n u in our notations, no? because I apply, so a goes out, and d n p x u is the partial derivative of n with respect to u, plus b and v. And here it's written that this is exactly lambda of p times, so of course everything here is evaluated at p. No? Uh, lambda of p times a x u plus b x v. Okay. But that means what? You see, uh, okay, that means that uh, n of u, n, n, the partial derivative of n with respect to u, for example, <coughs> Okay, so uh, just uh, one, one little. This is true for any a and b. So for any tangent vector, I have this. So I can take, for, for example, if I take a equal to 1 and b equal to 0, this is true. But for a equal to 1, I get what? nu is equal, and b equal to 0. A, nu is equal lambda xu. Okay, and if I take a equal to zero and b equal to one, this equation holds. So, n v is equal lambda x v. <clears throat> in particular, so this, these are interesting for two reasons. In particular, they imply immediately that lambda 
is a differentiable function. Lambda, in principle, was nothing and no, no regularity whatsoever. Because it's the, well, maybe you can argue automatically that it should be a continuous function because it's the eigenvalue of a differentiable family of maps. But eigenvalues of a differentiable family of maps are just continuous. They're not more than continuous because remember, what do you have to do to compute the eigenvalues? Okay, exercise. This is algebra and uh, you can think of it, okay? In, pr in general, in principle, they are nothing more than continuous. In fact, it's simple to write down examples where they are just continuous, okay? So, in this case, thanks to these equations, lambda is, differ is a differentiable function. You see it? I mean, the, it's the factor of proportionality between differentiable vectors. I mean, if lambda was C0 and, and not C1, this vector would be C0 and not C1. Okay? But this is C infinity. This is, okay? Think. Now, <clears throat> now, this is important because the way I want to argue that lambda, in fact, does not depend on P. Here I dropped the lambda of P. Now, remember, here there is a dependence on P. The way I want to argue that lambda does not depend on P is by taking its derivatives. So first I need to know that I can. I am allowed. Okay, so I am allowed, and now let's take the derivatives. How do I take derivatives? As usual. Here everything is, is differentiated with respect to U. Okay, let's take the derivative of this equation with respect to V. Here everything is differentiated with respect to V. Okay, let's take the derivative with respect to U. Why this is always the same trick? Because, of course, in both cases, on the left, I get the same thing, n u v, because, of course, the deriv partial derivatives commute. So if I take this with respect to v and this with respect to u, I get the same thing. So that means that this with respect to v is equal to this with respect to u. Let's write it down. What does it mean? La this with respect to v, lambda v x u v, sorry, lambda v, x u plus lambda x u v. So here, of course, these are vectors. And is equal to this with respect to u. Lambda u x v plus lambda x u v. OK? So there's another nice accident. And I get, so let's rewrite it just to, to see it better, lambda v x u is equal lambda u x v. Ah, very nice. Because x u and x v are a basis. So how is it possible that this is equal to this? It's impossible. Unless lambda u is equal lambda v is equal to 0. OK? which is exactly what I wanted. Because this is at every point. So lambda, or if you want now think back of the principal, the only principal curvature into the, in this game, because they are both the same, is constant on the connected component. So if the surface was at the beginning connected, it's constant everywhere. Okay? Now we have to argue that depending on this constant, the surface is a plane or a sphere. So now, lambda, how do we distinguish the two cases? Well, of course, we know the answer and we go back. So if lambda is equal to 0, so now I know that lambda was a function and now it's a number. So if lambda is 0, of course, I have to prove it's a plane. It's a piece of a plane. Well, but how is it possible that lambda is equal to zero? If lambda is equal to zero, the Gauss map is the zero, oh, sorry, uh, the, the differential of the Gauss map is the zero map everywhere. But then this implies that n is constant. It's a function whose derivative is zero everywhere. So 
being connected, so it's constant on the connected component. In particular, if it's connected, it's constant. So lambda equal to 0, then n is constant. Well, but n constant, it's a plane. Okay. It's a piece of a plane. So that's a trivial case. Now suppose that lambda is non-zero. <laughs> Let's look at here. And now with the extra information that this is not depending on P. Okay. What do I get out of this information? That D and P minus lambda the identity is zero. Okay. But then again, this implies, <coughs> or actually, uh, where can I get it even clearer? Wait a second, because it's, uh, um, right. Look at, look at these two equations. This is the best place where to look now. Look at these two equations, which of course come from there, but I mean here it's uh, transparent. X and N are two functions into R3, no? because are vector fields, which have the same partial derivatives with respect to the same coordinates up to a constant. That means that x and n differ by a constant. Well, x and the suitable multiple of n differ by the constant. Huh? That means that if you want x, x is equal to 1 over lambda, which is good because lambda is non-zero, 1 over lambda n, more or less. Plus a constant vector, because of course when I take derivatives, I don't see constant vectors. So this situation, I can say that in this situation, x of u, v, now let me write it, so they depend on u and v, minus 1 over lambda n of u, v, and here remember the little speech I made about the ambiguity of n being defined on uh, the, the domain of the chart or n being defined on the target of the chart, okay? But it's okay, n of u, v is equal to some constant vector constant vector. Okay, well, but then what is the sphere? Which is the right sphere? Well, this implies that x of uv, which is the point on the surface, minus c, which norm? How much is its norm? n is of norm 1. So this is just 1 over absolute value of lambda, because I don't know if lambda is positive or negative. Okay? So in fact, it's more usual to write down the square. So this, look, this is exactly the equation of the sphere of radius c and, oh sorry, of center c and of radius 1 over, la 1 over absolute value of lambda. Okay? Just one thing, how come in our computation lambda, which is the k1 or k2, in our computation it was uh, plus or minus 1 over r, um, plus or mi mi minus 1 over r. Why you should not be surprised? So you, you could have said, well, if this lambda is negative, it's a sphere. But no, this, this, this is clearly a wrong theorem. Because if I switch n, you see, in this proposition, there is no n. So lambda on the same surface can be positive or negative. Because I pick one choice of n, I get positive, for example. I mean, in the way we computed, we got negative. If I do the other choice, we got positive. So you see, there is no case 2 lambda positive, case 3 lambda negative. It would have been completely wrong. So zero and non-zero, these are the only two geometric distinctions. 
but positive or negative here, it would be crazy. Okay? And now just one final comment, I mean, but I don't even want to write it because really what do we have proved up to now? We have proved that the image of a chart is contained either in a plane or in the sphere. Well, but then the whole, since every point is contained in a chart, every point is contained in a chart. So there is only one thing to be worried about. Would it be possible on a surface to have two charts, one contains on a sphere of some center and some radius, and the other one contained either in another sphere of another center and another radius, or even worse, on a plane. So I mean, why these two cases? These two cases were built with the local chart. So if you change chart, in principle, you could jump from one to two. And in fact, two, you could jump from different centers and different radius. But no, by continuity. No? Lambda, this function lambda, is defined over the whole surface. And it's continuous over the whole surface. Okay? So I use the trick, the local chart trick, to compute, to get equations, to whatever. But I mean, lambda cannot be 1 here and 0 here. Well, I mean, it, 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 no. I mean, in principle, it could. But since I could join, I can join on the surface, I can go from any one point to the other with a sequence of charts intersecting each other. Of course, by connectness. But then, see, on the overlap, lambda has to be constant. So it has to be the same on, two, on the two sides. So lambda here is equal to lambda here. Then for the same reason, lambda here is equal to lambda here. Lambda here is equal to lambda here. Lambda here is equal to lambda here. So certainly I cannot pass from a sphere to a plane. Certainly if I pass from a sphere to another sphere, the two spheres must have the same radius because lambda... So now is it possible that passing from one sphere to the other sphere of the same radius, I change center? Exercise. All right, think about it, okay? But this in principle is possible from the way we have built things because C, which is the center of the sphere, is just kind of a constant of integration. Okay. So think, think of it, think about this, okay? Very well. Now, just one technical thing and they're actually improving the technical. You, you have seen how important it was in this kind of things to realize that our geometric functions, in principle, have very low regularity. Because usually the way to get interesting equation is to take derivatives. So now that you understand, because the first time you see this, you say, okay, come on, this will be certainly very nice functions and so on. No, in principle, not. Okay? So in this specific case, we have argued in this way. What about the regularity of Gauss curvature and mean curvature? And in general of K1 or K2, because see, here it turned out to be a smooth function only under this unbelievably strong assumption. Every point was big. I mean, we used it. Okay. So on, generally, on a surface, K1 and K2, which are clearly continuous because you compute them as eigenvalues of a family of differentiable maps, are they more than continuous? And, and Gauss curvature, is it more than continuous and so on? Now, so this looks like a kind of a technical thing, but you have seen already one example where it was the crucial technical thing. So let's spend 10 minutes on, on this problem. Sorry? Mm -hmm. So if eigenvalue is isolated, then uh, probably it will be differentiable. It satisfies all conditions which satisfies uh, the family of operators. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's okay. Don't, I mean, you don't need to put that 
complicated machinery, you will, we will prove immediately the best possible result by hand. Okay, so. Okay. Proposition. K and H are always smooth functions. So no, no hypothesis, okay? But K1 and K2 are continuous functions. which are smooth on the open set, smooth on the open set uh, of non-umbilical points. Now, in some sense, this is kind of dual of what we have just proved. Now, in the case of if every point is umbilical, of course, the open set of non-umbilical points is empty. So this theorem is, this proposition is quite sad. Now, it's smooth on the empty set. But actually, in that case, we found an ad hoc trick to prove it's smooth, okay? So this is saying some kind of the dual of what we were saying before. On your surface, you have few points, particular points, which are the umbilical points. They naturally form an open set, uh, sorry, a closed set. The set of umbilical points is always closed because it's the equation k1 is equal k2. They are continuous functions, so the set where two continuous functions coincide, it's a closed set. So if I remove it, I get an open set. And this proposition is just telling me, well, on these open sets, functions are also, the principal curvatures are differentiable. Okay, proof. Well, since it's a local statement, I mean, differentiability or not depends on the behavior of the function near one point, let's take a chart and let's do local computations. Local chart. <clears throat> with the standard notation now, we have n. So n, we, we, we look at n, which actually probably in the, when it was born, uh, we call it nx, but now I, I'm getting tired of this, okay? I confuse the function, the, the, the normal vector defined on u with the normal vector defined on s because they are naturally the same thing as long as you change the domain. Okay, and we have the standard basis of the tangent space at every point. Okay, so this is what we have in our hands. But now, since we have a basis of our, so that's, that's just to fix a choice of n. So I take this choice of n and not minus it. Okay, I do the computation with this choice. Of course, the statements are orientations invariant. I mean, if for some choice of n, this theorem is true, for the opposite choice of n, this theorem is true, because the worst thing that can happen is that things change sign. So if something was C, C infinity, the other one is C infinity, and vice versa, okay? So I have a standard basis of the tangent space, and first fundamental form, second fundamental form, and the differential of the Gauss maps are all operators on the tangent space. So, I can represent them with matrices with respect to this basis, both on the domain and on the target, okay? So, let me say that the first fundamental form is represented, so I use this symbol to say, with respect to this, with respect to this standard basis, is represented by the matrix M, okay? The second fundamental form will be represented 
by the matrix sigma and plus or minus, I mean, we will find it, let's say minus D and P is represented by the matrix A. Okay, just to fix notation. Well, what does it mean? Actually, since I'm going to write it down anyway, what is M? Well, M, so what is the quadratic form, what is the matrix representation of the quadratic form with respect to the basis of the vector space? M will be the two by two matrix, where here you put the quadratic form evaluated to first vector, first vector. Here you put quadratic form evaluated to first vector, second vector. Here, second vector, first vector, but it's symmetric. So you get the same thing. And here you put second quadratic form applied to second vector, second vector. In the case of the first fundamental form, that means just scalar product of, the first fundamental form is just the scalar product. So scalar product of xu with itself. So norm of xu squared. Here I put scalar product xu, xv. Here I put the same thing, doesn't matter the order. And here I put the norm of xv squared. Okay. Now historically, again, Gauss, for some reason, gave name to these functions. There was really no particular need for that. But in every book you will find that E, capital E, is the function x u squared. F is the function x u x v. And G, capital N, eh, is equal to x v squared. So basically, the matrix representation becomes EFFG. Now, clearly, these functions are smooth. X of U, XU and XV are smooth vector fields. So the scalar product does not disturb differentiability. OK? Very well. What is sigma? Well, again, Gauss decided that sigma was the matrix E, F, F, G. Okay, just to check that if students have enough symbols in their, okay, E, F, F, G. But what is little e? For example, little e will be the second fundamental form applied to X, U, X, U. Okay. So the definition would be this. But we have already done some computations. Okay? That tells us, well, we can redo it immediately if you want, but this becomes equal, and here is where I hope I've not forgot the minus. Hmm. <clears throat> should be with a plus, n x u u. Okay. So remember, this by definition is minus d n x u, x u. Then minus d n x u is essentially by definition n u. Okay. And now you take the only information that you know is that n scalar x u is equal to zero. And you take the derivative with respect to u. And this tells you that nu xu plus n xu u is equal to 0. So it's correct. So minus nu xu is equal to plus n xu u. That was hidden in a proof we did a uh, couple of times ago, OK? Or probably last, probably last time. Okay. Well, for the, with the same trick, f, which would be by definition, x u x v, it turns out to be my n x u v. And little g, which would be by definition x v x v, is in computation. I mean, these are, this is because this is very easy to compute. Okay? Of course, you can also use the definition, but I mean, this formula. I mean, you will see why in a second, but I mean, it's clear. You don't have to take the derivative. So what is the difference? I prefer not to take the derivative of n. 
It's just uh, psycho psychology, if you want. But n uh, is born as a vector divided by its norm. Division by the norm means that here there is a square root of the, squ of the sum of the squares. So since I'm lazy, I don't want to always, every time to take the derivative of the square root to the minus 1. Okay? In this formula, n is left as it is, and x gets another derivative. So you, you need to compare this formula with minus nu xu. Now, depending on the situation, one would be easier. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> but now, also these little functions, efg, are smooth functions. Because it's, again, scalar products of smooth, of smooth vector fields. Okay. What is the matrix A? So now A depends, I mean, we can write A in terms of M and sigma. A, and here is where, I'm pretty sure sooner or later there will be a minus jumping. Anyway, minus M inverse sigma. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a plus. I think this is a plus. Okay, double check it, okay? No, uh, next time if you want, I'll double check it too, but I mean, I'm pretty sure this is a plus. In any case, let's go on for a second with the minus, otherwise we change sign everything at the end, it doesn't matter, okay? What, how much is this? Well, of course this is, so this would be minus, if that's true, M is the, the capital one, E, F, F, G, inverse, times the matrix E, F, F, G, little, okay? Independently whether there is the minus. How much is the inverse of this? Well, this is easy, fortunately, because it's a two by two, okay? I don't have to write down very complicated formula. So this would be, of course, one over the determinant, so minus I have to keep it. One over the determinant. The determinant is just E, G minus F squared. times g e minus f minus f, okay? And then times always the same thing, e f f g, okay? Well, but then now do, do the product. And so if, as usual, a is the matrix which has entries a, i, j, okay? With i and j going from one to two, you, you should find this formula, for example, A11, so what is the first entry of this matrix? Well, it means just take this times this. Okay, and this is where, no, I mean, my computers are consistent with this minus, so, okay, so this will be, um, let me first write this because it gets minus FF, but there is a minus in front, so this becomes FF minus G, divided by eg minus f squared. Then how much is a12? Well, a12 you find it by 1, 2. So for the same reason, it's uh, fg, f, fg minus fg. <coughs> divided by eg minus f squared. Of course, a21 you have to end up with the, the same, no. Um, no, 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 okay, A12, A12, okay, and A21, well, okay, this will be probably, must be correct sometimes, A21 should be, this times this, so it will be Fe, Fe. Well, you have to do it because, of course, when you read it, it sounds stupid. It's Fe minus Fe, okay? Now, the problem is what is, what is capital and what is not. So, minus this one, so it's Fe, capital Fe, minus uh, capital Ef, okay? 
divided by eg minus f squared, and then you get a22, which is 2, 2, okay, plus ff minus eg divided by eg minus f squared, okay? Well, more or less, because of course, uh, double check everything because here mistakes are very easy to do. And now, so what is the, for example, the Gauss curvature? Well, the Gauss curvature is the determinant of this matrix uh, because it's the product of the eigenvalues. I don't need to know the eigenvalues. Okay. I don't need to compute first the eigenvalues and then compute the Gauss curvature. I take the determinant of the matrix and that's it. So K, which is just the, that A, well, do the computation. Now, my possible mistakes are irrelevant because my possible mistakes are, are a minus somewhere and switching these two, I can tell you, OK? Uh, in some, I don't, OK? But in any case, the determinant doesn't care, OK? So that, that A turns out to be EF minus FE e divided by EG minus F squared. Well, maybe actually we should have done a comment sooner or later. Dividing by EG minus F squared, it's OK. It's the determinant of this matrix, of the, of the matrix M. Now. M is certainly an invertible matrix because it's the scalar product, okay? Cannot have determinant zero. Must be, okay? Must be positive. And how much is H? Also the trace of a matrix. So H is the trace minus trace of A over two because actually it's the average of the eigenvalues, no? Well, also this one, you don't need to compute the eigenvalues. No? You can actually compute it automatically given the matrix and turns out to be 1 half EG plus G minus 2 FF divided by the, the usual thing, EG minus F squared. Okay, just one comment. Everybody's doing a little bit of geometry of surfaces should remember by heart this formula. I don't know anybody who remembers by heart this formula. Okay? So don't don't worry. I mean <laughs> okay. it actually takes five minutes to recover it. But and that's the best way for me to do mathematics. But I mean this and actually, I've never studied mathematics trying to learn something by heart. But I mean, by the end of this course, you will have to have done this computation so many times that you will remember it. It's, it's, it's a way to check that if you have studied enough. Okay? Don't try to remember if you have made 150 exercises, this formula will be automatic. Okay? You, you will learn it by brute force. In any case, in any case, what are these formula telling us with respect to the, prop actually this formula are more important than the, the actual proposition, but first corollary, the, prop the first line of the proposition. Because once we have argued that EF, EFG capital and EFG non-capital are smooth functions, well, K and H are smooth functions, okay? And they don't care about umbilical, umbilical they don't care about anything. So why the principal curvature care? Well, once you know that the determinant and the trace of a two by two matrix, you actually know the eigenvalue. So you can go the other way around. In general, in the exercises, what you really do is you compute the eigenvalues and make the product and you make the average. But here we can do it on a conceptual level. We can play the opposite game. We have K, we have H. What are K1 and K2? Well, K1 and K2, so Ki, meaning one or two, is what? The trace plus or minus the square root of H squared minus K. 
I mean, meaning it's completely general, this formula, between the trace, the determinant, and the eigenvalues of a function, of a metric, of a two by two metric. Okay? So, how do I prove the second part of the proposition? Well, these functions, you see here, of course, the problem is that there is a square root. Sooner or later, a square root had to come out, you know, because in this, in this line of proof comes out here. Now, the square root, of course, is smooth as long as what is inside is different from zero. So how is it possible that the thing inside is equal to zero? Well, how is it possible that, in principle, I mean, there is a factor, huh? but I mean, the trace squared is equal to the determinant. I mean, the average uh, is equal to the determinant. You check it in three seconds. This is if and only if the two eigenvalues are the same. Well, actually, no, sorry. The fact that it happens if and only if the two eigenvalues are the same, it's, it's here. I mean, if this is zero, k1 is equal to k2. So you are at an umbilical point. So outside the umbilical points, this is smooth. That's for sure. Now, if you want to know more, right, sorry, no. So the point is that you have to convince yourself that this equal to zero happens only at umbilical points. Okay? So at where the two eigenvalues coincide. But it's standard two by two, by two linear algebra. Okay? And we are done for today.